So thank you very much for the invitation and the organizer Chiara and Marcello. And I think this is uh, the first example of a really um, hybrid, a hybrid um, conference that worked. So I'm, I'm, I have been following for the last few days and uh, it really has been uh, really wonderful. Um, both the people in the location and uh, outside everywhere in the world. So. Um, Really, thank you for giving us this example. So I'm going to um, first start with a, a list of topics that uh, are an outline of the talk. So I'm going to recall um, just briefly global well-posedness for the equations that I will consider, which is going to be cubic NLS in 2D. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the uh, transfer of energy. And I have to thank both uh, um, Montalto and Maspero for uh, already having done a great job in uh, um, reminding us what these concepts are. Um, then, uh, since we talk about transfer energy, and as I've been explained in uh, these previous two talks, uh, one reduced to estimating the um, asymptotics of the Sobolev norms of these solutions and both uh, upper bounds and lower bounds, in a sense. Um, and in particular, in this context, I will uh, uh, recall two um, uh, previous results, one with uh, the I team. Koliander, Kiel, myself, Takao, Kentao, and the other one by Carl and Fau. And uh, finally, I will uh, uh, give some old and new results on the um, comparison between the rational and irrational case for the torus and some pictures coming from uh, um, numerical experimentations that some of my collaborators did. Okay, so uh, from now on, really the equation we'll be looking at is uh, the Schrodinger equation. We are in two dimension periodic and uh, we are cubic here. And uh, there is a one in front, which tells us that uh, this equation is the defocus inversion. And U0 is the initial data, which is gonna be um, really throughout the talk, mostly is gonna be in HS for arbitrary large S. And just from the beginning, we agree on what it is um, a torus which is rational or irrational. So we're gonna look at uh, the symbol of the Laplacian or even like the eigenvector, eigenvalues, that's the same thing basically. And uh, K1 and K2 are the two com components of my frequency vectors K, which is gonna be in Z2. And the uh, symbol is omega one square K one square plus omega two square K two square and uh, omega one and omega two, omega two one square and omega two square are strictly positive, obviously. And if the ratio is a rational number then we call the torus rational. And if instead is irrational then oh, clearly it's gonna be an irrational torus. Um, now in uh, this system comes from physics, and this is well known. Definitely, I don't have to talk about that, but um, I just want to remind everybody that there are two conserved quantity. The first one is the mass, which is uh, uh, really an L2 square of U. And the second one is the energy or Hamiltonian, which consists of the kinetic part, which is the gradient of U square, and then the potential part. This has conserved. Um, and then there is a theorem really due to Bourgain that says that uh, if um, U0 is in HS as strictly greater, uh, sorry, greater or equal than one, then there exists a global solution. This global solution um, is uh, unique. There is stability with respect to that. Um, so basically there is well poisonous and belongs into HS for each time continuous spanner. Um, and moreover, as I mentioned, the solution is stable. Now, I need to say that the local result of Bourgain, it's really for S strictly greater than zero. And I will go back to this later on in a moment. The fact that you assume S greater or equal than one uh, in order to have, to have a global solution um, is due to the fact that you wanted to concatenate or iterate the local result to a global. And in order to do that, you use the conservation of the mass and the energy. There are, um, to be precise, there are some um, global results as well below, strictly be below one using the I method, but I will not talk about that. 
So now that we know, oh, by the way, another remark is that uh, the original proof of Bruggen was done in the square torus, so basically a uh, rational torus, but uh, after the Strickart's estimates were proved for any torus <clears throat> by Bruggen and Demeter in 2014, then the same exact proof that Bruggen gave at the beginning goes through. Um, okay, so, um, one question that we wanted to address is what happens to the solution as t goes to infinity. Now, this is a question that in a two dimension and on, when there are no boundary um, uh, boundary conditions. So, if you are in the whole plane with no boundaries, hence dispersion can kick in with no obstacles. Then, uh, thanks to our result of Dodson, we know. Um, a lot about the um, asymptotic behavior of a, a global solution. And in fact, Dodson proved that there is scattering, meaning there exist two profiles, one for T going to infinity and the other one going to minus infinity. So U plus U minus in HS. Note that S is strictly, um, sorry, greater or equal than zero. So even at the L2, le L2 level, this works. And if you evolve linearly these two profiles, then they are such that if you take U minus this linear evolution, either in the plus infinity or minus infinity with the appropriate profile, then you go to zero. So this tells us that uh, um, a plus and minus infinity, the nonlinear solution approaches a linear solution. And this as a consequence tells us that any HS norm for S greater or equal than zero remains bounded uniformly in time. The reason being that you can simply add and subtract the linear evolution at, as t is large, that becomes small because the limit equals to zero. And um, the HS norm of the linear evolution is constant because the group ST is unitary. So <clears throat> in uh, uh, on the plane with no boundary uh, conditions, the dispersion actually causes this uh, uh, really precise analysis of the um, nonlinear solution. But in the case of the torus, that's not the case. And hence, we, we need to study with different tools what happens to the, um, the solution itself. One way of studying this uh, as I was mentioned in previous talks by Montalto and Maspero, is by looking at the uh, um, transfer of energy. In their cases, they were analyzing the linear Schrodinger width potential. And in our case, we are looking at the nonlinear um, evolution, particularly cubic. But the question it remains the same. And if we look, for example, um, at the following profile of the Fourier coefficient square at time zero, which are localized on a small frequency, we ask, and this is a question mark, whether later on in time, this profile migrates to large K. And uh, this is called the transfer of energy and in particular forward cascade because we are forward and uh, the L2 norm is conserved, so we're not gonna go backwards. Um, so there are, if such a process happens, actually this is going to be um, happening in a sort of rigid manner. Um, the reason, one reason it's uh, evident from the graph. So for example, if you look at the area of the subgraph of this function, which is the modulo of Fourier coefficient square, well, that area is nothing else than the mass that has to remain conserved. So the area of the subgraph has to remain conserved if there is migration from low to high. And of course, there is also a conservation of uh, um, energy, which impose an extra constraint on it. Now, another um, observation to make um, is that the um, solution is gonna take some time to see the effect of the boundaries. And uh, we know that if you don't see the boundaries, you're gonna spread kind of a dispersing manner. So you, this phenomenon of growth is gonna happen for T very large. Um, and also the um, rationality of the torus, or irrationality in, that, in some sense, is gonna mitigate in a way the impact of the manifolds. That's sort of in an intuitive manner, that's something that we can just see 
with a thought process, a thought experiments, like if we hit the boundary with the wave, if the torus is rational, then there is more um, chance that, well, it's gonna go back on itself at some point, while if you are irrational, it's gonna have more room to spread. And in particular, in fact, it's gonna matter what kind of irrationality you have. So in some sense, how far is that rational, irrational number to a rational one? And somehow we're gonna see this in analysis in some sense, and I'm gonna point this out later. Okay, so, <clears throat> As it was mentioned, one way of uh, understanding whether the uh, Fourier coefficient square, um, the magnitude of the Fourier coefficient square is gonna move to high frequency could be by hitting it by a weight K to the two S, think of S very large. And if in time, this, this uh, function has support for K large, and then this quantity should grow, in particular, if we sum all of it. And in fact, if we sum with respect to K, well, that's, is nothing else than the HS norm square. And we're gonna think, as I mentioned before, for S large, because we are interested really in a, a smooth data in this, in this case. So here is the reason why we are interested on the growth of the sober norms as T tends to plus or minus infinity. But since it's reversible, let's just concentrate on the plus infinity. So we already realized, and as I mentioned before, that if I'm in R2, no boundaries, then scattering prevents this growth. So that's something where we will not see growth. Um, on the other hand, if we are in dimension one, both on the line and on the circle, there is integrability. In particular, there are infinitely many conservation law and uh, um, you can look at them out any kind of order of derivative, you can recombine them and that will give you a uniform bound of the um, subbullet norms for any S, at least natural number. So we're not gonna look in our do and we are not gonna look in one dimension. So really the cubic NLS in T2 is the first meaningful and interesting case to consider. Now, bounds from above. Um, so here I'm gonna um, recall a few facts about the nonlinear um, case, and then also some facts about the linear, which has been covered really nicely by my, the previous two speakers. But in terms of the nonlinear, um, for the equation that I introduced, the cubic NLS, um, torus, any kind of torus, you have that the HS norm um, is bounded by polynomial of degree two times S minus one plus a epsilon, epsilon just arbitrarily greater at zero. Um, the original proof of this fact was in fact due to Burgen and it was um, for the square torus, but it is based on Strickard's estimates. Hence, once the Strickard's estimates were proved um, for any tori, then the proof just was the same. And the work of Soinger instead is a different type because it uses the upside down I method. Um, but the conclusion is uh, what I just mentioned. And just to give you an idea, how do you get this kind of result so far? And hopefully somebody will give a different kind of proof that uh, could lower this uh, degree here, um, is the following. It comes from the improvement of the local estimate. In general, when you do a local estimate, well, you start, let's say at time n, you want to have, want to know what happens at time, or you start at time n minus one, you want to have what times at times, what happens at times n. And usually when you do your local well poisonous, you can say that the HS norma UN is less or equal than a constant, strictly greater than one, times what happens at n minus one. Um, of course, if that constant, you put a constant here, which is greater than one, then you would just get an exponential bound. But what Borgen proved is that you can improve that by putting one here, but of course this one here really accounts for just a linear evolution. So you had to correct for your nonlinearity. And he did correct, in fact, put here a constant greater than one, but lower the exponent of the HS norm. So once you have this uh, um, estimates, then really it's easy to prove that the growth cannot be more than a polynomial of degree one over sigma. So in the work of Bourguin, the two, uh, this was the quantity that he put in there. Okay. So um, this is what uh, um, it's the upper bound for the equation that we have. And let me mention a couple of things since we are um, 
comparing rational and irrational. Let me mention these two results of Deng and Germain and Deng. Um, the first one, it's about the, um, well, we are in dimension three, first of all, and the nonlinearity is what we call subcritical nonlinearity, so it's between three and five. And there is, a, um, again, a polynomial bound, but the remarkable fact is that uh, if you are in a generic tori, and really for certain irrational in a certain sense with where the, the um, omega one square of omega two square is um, satisfy certain Diophantine conditions in a way and irrational, well, the degree of the polynomial becomes smaller by this factor here. It's not important what it is, but the point is that it becomes smaller compared to the situation if you were on the square torus or rational torus. Um, so that's uh, um, it's a result that is actually due to the fact that uh, um, if you are an irrational tori, Strickard's estimates hold for longer stretch of time. So this is, goes back to what I was just saying intuitively before. Um, the irrational tour sort of gives you a little bit more room, not for a full dissipation um, uh, dispersion, but for a, um, sort of a mild dispersion in a sense. And then Deng did prove a similar result, but uh, um, in the critical space, that's a harder in dimension three. And uh, um, of course, the degree of the polynomial is bigger as expected because um, it is a, a critical situation. Okay, um, what is the expected growth in a sense? Um, well, that's not uh, well completely clear in the nonlinear situation. And in the previous two talks by Montalt and Maspero, um, they gave a beautiful um, you know, uh, argument for uh, uh, saying that at least in those cases where there is a potential, um, some kind of mild growth like exponential, um, of, uh, sorry, like a polynomial with exponent epsilon or even log is what one should expect. And that's actually is what people think should happen in, in the, um, also in the nonlinear case. And I'm gonna give a result in a moment that uh, um, gives more supporting uh, argument for that. So let me just recall briefly, since this has been done um, early in a way, um, the case in which we consider the linear uh, NLS with potential V. Here, I'm only gonna report the original results of Urgen. And then as you learn yesterday, there are a much improved result and much more general by um, collection of, uh, um, um, of authors that I just mentioned up below. Uh, but in terms of the original result of Burgen, um, let me just say that if you, uh, while well, there are some restrictions on the potential, of course, back then, which then were eliminated and much more generalized later. But in this case, if VTX is bounded periodic also in time, and he considered the rational case only at that time, but as we learned yesterday, that uh, rationality uh, property was removed. Um, by um, some of the author down here. But in any case, in this case, he proves that uh, um, for that V, then SV here means just the evolution of this particular linear with the potential is bounded by the polynomial of degree epsilon. And uh, if you assume even further constraints on V, then you also improve the bound and that's of a logarithmic type. Okay, so this is what I wanna say about the upper bounds. Um, now let's think about the bounds from below. One, one exhibit now um, actually a solution for my original NLS um, equation that I consider so nonlinear that uh, gives us growth. So that's uh, so we say that we cannot grow more than a certain amount, but we actually have solutions that grow. Um, in terms of the linear. Uh, problem with potential, Borgen already proved um, when he was uh, uh, showing us what I mentioned here to be the result of two, that actually there is, a, you can construct a solution that has the log growth. Um, and uh, this makes hence the result of Borgen, that one um, sharp in a sense. And as I mentioned, this has been uh, improved and, and uh, um, uh, re uh, re revisited and much more generalized by the other authors. Um, also something to remark is that uh, Cookson is uh, um, also work in, on this problem in the nonlinear case, but again, there is no um, you know, um, 
strong results in that direction in terms of constructions, but I wanna present two that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and the first one is the one that we proved some time ago with the Coliander, Kiel, Takao, and Tao. And let me just go over this for a little bit. Um, and the results says the following. So suppose you consider the NLS equation that I have been uh, uh, working on from the beginning, but in that theorem, the um, assumption was that the torus was rational. We fix S to be greater than one. This is just like the order of derivative, as I mentioned, is just taken large. We are looking at uh, smooth data. And we fix a small constant sigma and a large constant K. So then what we prove is that we can construct an initial data with the regularity that we're looking for that is smaller than this uh, constant sigma. And if we wait long enough, then the value of the evolution of this uh, uh, initial data via the equation that uh, uh, we are looking at becomes larger than K. Now, this exhibits some growth, but it's not a very satisfactory theorem in the sense that it's a very weak type of growth. And it's not satisfactory because first of all, we don't know what happens after capital T. So um, it's unlikely we think that the, the um, HS norm will uh, uh, go down, but uh, uh, we, we are not sure. Um, and it doesn't give really any kind of uh, logarithmic growth um, at this point. Now, let me just mention a couple of words how the theorem was proved. I remember that the torus was actually square, so hence rational, and we were looking for a, a solution uh, that will grow so we can assume that the, we have an ansatz. This ansatz looks like this. And so when we plug into the equation, we're gonna get an infinite system of ODEs where the a n t vector is the unknown. And this is how it looks. Um, now we think that the growth is due to the resonance. So when you um, look, when you transform the cubic nonlinearity into Fourier transform, you will get a convolution. So with the sum of the three coefficients here is in the set in which there is a constraint, which is due to the fact that you have to consider the convolution, but also to the fact that the, the um, omega four, which is n one square minus n two square plus n three square minus n is zero. So this means that the frequencies n one and two and three and four are in resonance. Okay, so that's the uh, starting point. Obviously, this is a very large system. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy to um, analyze it, especially its growth in a sense uh, by dynamical system tools, unless you make it a little bit easier. And that's what we did. We um, put extra constraints or restrictions on the uh, resonance set. Um, we ended up with uh, a toy model, which I'm gonna write down here. So then this is the really the dynamics that we look at. So this is a toy model that uh, um, involves now a vector of finite dimension, B1 to Bn. These Bs are connected to the A's before actually. And um, it is um, in a sense, um, um, a type of dynamics that happens in within the resonant system that I just mentioned here. So in a sense, it's a subset of that in some sense. Um, it does have good properties in the sense that uh, it conserves mass, it conserves energy and conserves momentum. And in particular, the fact that it conserves the mass tells you that the whole dynamics is happening in this complex sphere. Um, so if you think about the vector B1, Bn, then the conservation of mass, you can think by normalization that just tells you that the magnitude of that vector square is one, and hence it really lives in this sphere. But there are obstructions which, um, as I said, this is if there is a growth, it's gonna have to be, well, there are a kind of uh, enemies towards that growth, perhaps the conservation loss. And the way we see the enemies in this uh, reduced system, this toy model, is that there are these large big circles. Um, I'm gonna call it tau one, tau two, and tau three. And in a sense, tau one, tau two, and tau three are ordered up to tau n, are ordered in this way because really they are describing going from low frequency to high frequency. 
And if you are trapped in any of these big circles, then you are not able to get out. Hence, the dynamics would not evolve to, let's say, from low to high. So what we prove is that we can find, let's call initial data close to the first great circle, and we are managed to avoid to be trapped in all the other ones and end up in the last big circle. And this is really the transfer of energy viewed in terms of the toy model. It turned out though, that if the toy model actually has this growth, then the whole original system has this growth because there is a pretty strong stability type of result that we can do. Um, so this is how we, uh, we prove this growth. And uh, the next result that I want to mention is of a different type. It's not about the HS norm, uh, but it's about really finding excited modes, um, construct a solution that, excite, that has excited modes uh, farther in time. So this is uh, the result of uh, um, Carl and Fau. Also in their theorem, the torus is rational. Again, it's the square torus. S is fixed or the derivative. And they construct a solution UT such that at time zero, um, it's uh, just the um, uh, obtained by exciting the modes in the ball or radius two. So for example, here is a little bit of a picture at time zero, there are only these modes that are excited. Mm -hmm. And then they prove um, that this uh, initial data evolves in a way, uh, by the way, this is for small data. So HS is small. And uh, um, uh, they prove that uh, um, if you take any frequency as far as you like, then there is a, a correspondent time TK such that the Fourier coefficient at that frequency and at that time is greater than epsilon one plus sigma. So this tells you that there is something happen over there. It's important this exponent one plus sigma because I'm gonna um, go back to this in a second. Okay, so this is the result of Carl and Fau. Um, there are a couple of results that were mentioned also yesterday that I really want to point it out. In particular, the result by Hani, Pusader, <clears throat> Zetko, and Vishilia. And they consider the cubic defocusing NLS in a mixed manifold R cross TD, uh, D equals two, three, and four rational. And T equals, of course, you can go plus or minus infinity. And they show that actually the dynamics of the toy model is really the dynamics that uh, controls the behavior of these solutions for this particular mixed manifold as T goes to infinity. And in particular, they prove this growth, which is the log log growth. And that's another supporting argument for the fact that the log, some kind of log, is the right thing. Um, then the other important work to recall, uh, which is done in a very granular way, I would say, is that of Gerard and Gallier, Patrick Gerard and Gallier, Sandrine Gallier, and they prove, um, as I say, very precise asymptotic behavior for the solutions of the Zego system. To be recalled, this, interestingly enough, the Zego system is also an integrable system, but the conservation law attached to them are no energy, so they don't have a definite sign. Okay, so um, I guess at this point, I would like to start talking about what happens or these results that we mentioned, if instead of the rational case, which was the assumption in there, you consider a rational case. So there is a, a, a theorem that I proved with uh, Bobby Wilson, one of my uh, postdocs. Um, so the original question was, while well, try to uh, reprove the uh, result of the I team that I mentioned also in the irrational case and see how the toy model worked in that way. And there were some, um, something that didn't quite work out back then. So we um, start realizing that the situation could be different. And in fact, what we show is that if we are irrational and any kind of irrational actually, and for this uh, theorem, again, S is fixed, that's the order of derivative. And we're gonna fix also M. Um, then if you have U0, which is like a smooth initial data, and the support of the U0 in the frequency space is in this ball or radius M. Then we can find an epsilon such that if U0 is less than, uh, I would say an epsilon zero such that if U0, the edge norm of U0 is less than uh, epsilon, strictly less than epsilon zero, then the unique solution to the cubic NLS um, which we call U in within the right time of existence 
um, is such that the Fourier coefficient now is less than epsilon cube in this time of existence. If the frequency k is outside this uh, ball of radius m. So this is a sort of um, uh, not, not the same thing that happens in particular in the result of uh, Carl and Fau, because if you remember in their case, you said that uh, we could find a time, a large time uh, for each frequency, such that there was still something quite large, well, relatively speaking, which was epsilon to the one plus sigma, sigma just strictly less than zero. And here we are saying say, that everything is less than epsilon cube. So there is something going on in the irrational case that uh, um, prevents the constructions of the, uh, at least Fau's theorem to happen here. And there is also, um, it's not phrased that way, but there is also, um, you can prove that also the construction that we did with the I team cannot happen because the way um, the frequencies uh, that contribute to the dynamic of the toy model cannot be um, constructed the way we did. And I'm going to go back to this in a second. Okay. So, um, one other remark to make is that this theorem that I just stated is for small initial data. And what I wanted to, in fact, talk a little bit later is just removing this assumption. Um, and another thing that I want to mention is that with the theorem that we prove with Bobby, uh, of course, we don't say, we are not claimed that there is not a growth mechanism. We just say that the, whatever growth me mechanism uh, was used in order to prove the two theorems in the rational case that I remember just will not happen here. Um, and also finally, the result that we obtain, it's sort of in agreement with the better polynomial bounds that were exhibited in the two results of Deng, Germain and Deng um, obtained for the irrational torus. So just quickly what the um, type of argument was there. So um, in, the, in the result that I mentioned of uh, um, Bobby and I, we use the infinite dimension Birkhoff norm of normal form reduction. Um, and we um, really, a big role is played by the resonance set that uh, um, you obtain when you are in the irrational case. And I will spend um, some time talking about that because I think that's an important part. Um, so we, by you, after you use the um, normal for reduction, you have a reduced system, which is really the resonant part, purely resonant part. And for this system, we prove that there is really nothing happening outside the ball of, uh, let's say, radius 2m. If you start a ball of radius m, we don't have anything happening outside 2m. And then, of course, you have to go back to the original system by using the sort of change of variables dictated by the Birkhoff normal form. And that's where you lose the epsilon outside the ball, but it's an epsilon of very small power. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit about the um, four-wave resonance set in the rational case. Um, the key point here is that uh, when you um, write down, so remember, this is the symbol of the Laplacian, which I mentioned before and uh, in particular the eigenvalue lambda k, if you think in those terms, then when you write it down, you see that uh, uh, the rationality of the torus um, tells you or shows you that you can separate the uh, frequency one, sorry, the um, uh, first coordinate of the frequency from the second one. So for example, here, just to make things simple, let's, which is what I'm gonna assume later as well. Let's assume that the omega one square is one and omega two square is just uh, uh, square root of two. So then you see that there is no mixing in this relationship here and in this relationship here between the first coordinates and the second coordinates because the rationality of the, of the number that you have there and the fact that the k's, the frequency k's have uh, uh, lived in the uh, lattice z2. So what we see is that the resonance set in the rational case splits into two decoupled one dimension, if you like, resonant, uh, resonance set with a one dimensional resonant um, interaction. Okay, so um, another remark is that uh, 
once you have um, K, the frequency K1, K2, K3, and K4 in resonance, both in the rational and irrational case, well, they actually represent vertices of rectangles. And these rectangles could be, uh, well, in the rational case, they are parallel to the axis, or they are diamonds, or they are degenerate. So it could be of this configuration, this configuration of degenerate like that. In particular, there is this uh, um, uh, diamond shape, which does not appear when you have the irrational torus kind of um, type of a, um, um, resonance um, relationship. Now, it's to be noted that in both the result of uh, the I-team and uh, Carl and Fau, you can actually follow the dynamics and you see the following. So you start at time zero by the blue, um, the blue dots is the dots that are going to be excited. And this is in both theorems. And then the evolution, the way it is constructed is such that the next step you evolve into this diamond shape given to you by the red dots. The next step, you go back to the rectangle is square here because actually in those cases we were using um, the square torus we used. Anyway, so there is the um, uh, green dots and so on. The next step is another bigger diamond. Now in the, um, I just mentioned that in the rational case, this kind of configuration, the diamonds, so this intermediate stepping stone are not there. So the dynamics really cannot progress through those ones. And this is a, an important remark to make. Um, okay, so the type of recent results that uh, um, I wanted to describe is actually in collaboration with uh, two more people. Rabsky, Alex Rabsky and Yulin Pan. Alex is a graduate student of Yulin. And uh, um, Rabsky and Pan are actually the expert in uh, numerical uh, computation, which by the way is not, um, has not been really, um, I think pursued in uh, this context um, too much, except probably from the work of uh, um, Coliander, uh, Sulem and um, Simon. Okay, so let's just uh, state the theorems that we, we proved more recently. Um, just to fix the idea, let's assume that uh, um, we, we, of course, we are in the irrational torus and omega square or omega two square is uh, a number alpha, which is irrational. But for the theorems that I'm gonna describe below, there is another property that one has to consider and that there has to be algebraic. So an irrational number, you know what it is, an algebraic number uh, means that it is the solution of a certain Diophantine equation with rational coefficients. Okay, so the first theorem is about the barrier. Um, so we fix again S, S is large, um, fix a time, time is long, and an epsilon small and N, which really tells us where the initial data are localized in the frequency space. Um, then for any R, so this tells us R measures the uh, size of the initial data, as you can see down here. So for any R, there exists an M. So M depends on all the parameters I just mentioned before, such that if you zero in the HS norm is less than R and it's supporting this ball or radius N, and U is the solution of the cubic defocus NLS in this rational torus, I'm going to index, oh, this, I forgot to put the square here, t square alpha, then uh, there is a barrier. So what this tells you, I mean, this whole complicated things, if you just read it in terms of Fourier coefficient, tells you that whatever happens in the Fourier coefficient outside of this barrier M, it's very small. So there is nothing happening out there. Um, this is similar to the uh, work with Bobby that I mentioned, except that here we are removing the smallness. This is any kind of size of initial data. Okay, so there is a, a really almost nothing happening outside this uh, barrier M. For this barrier M, I say depends on the, all those uh, parameters, but we have a sort of an explicit depends, which I'm not claiming to be sharp at all, but uh, uh, we can actually compute what that is, at least based on the proof that we gave. Now, in order to describe the next result, um, I need to introduce uh, a definition, and this is the definition of a quasi-resonance set. 
So a quasi-resonance set um, depends on two parameters, lambda and tau, which uh, are gonna be positive. And we say that uh, frequency K1, K2, K3, and K4 are in quasi-resonancy if it satisfies well, the same constraints that I wrote before, which comes just from the convolution. Um, when you go to, the, to express your nonlinearity in terms of Fourier coefficient. And then it, it tells you that uh, this, uh, um, the resonance interaction that I described before is not necessarily just zero, but it could be less than lambda over this number here. So k1 square, k2 square, and so on, to the power one plus tau. So why do we want to do this? I mean, what's the point of this? And I'm going to go back to that in a second, but just remember that this is the parameter lambda and this is the parameter tau where it appears. Um, as I will mention a little bit, the uh, parameter lambda will be used actually later on to offset the large data condition that we have. And I want to mention right now that in a posteriori, if one goes back and look at uh, um, a paper by Coliander, Kwon, and all, um, they use a similar kind of idea of uh, using, um, they do that very much implicit in an implicit form, but uh, um, using this lambda to offset large data. Okay, so the second result is the following. So now let's consider again the same um, NLS, except that now the cubic nonlinearity is not the total cubic nonlinearity, but is the one that is relative to the quasi resin set, depending on lambda and tau. And uh, uh, my uh, initial data U0 is such that the support is uh, in a, um, well, let me, let me, in the first statement, it's just U0 is uh, um, generic L2 data. So what we can prove is that this uh, um, NLS, which is just the, the rest, the quasi resin part, is globally well posed in L2. So I'm gonna stress L2 and I'm gonna mention in a moment in a remark why I wanna stress that, but this is L2. And in fact, actually here I put the defocusing case, but uh, this result is true for focusing and defocusing. And then the next bit is that if the uh, support of the initial data is in a ball or radius N, then outside a ball or radius M where M is related to N is bigger and we have a precise relationship, there is nothing. In fact, there is nothing, any HS norm outside that supported outside the ball is zero. So if we start with something which is concentrated on the ball itself, at least for any time and for any S. Um, in, you can, in uh, the argument you can make, you have a, um, you, you can see that this M actually depends on uh, the, um, the lambda and tau. And uh, in a way, the, um, in a sense, if your alpha, which is the rationality of the torus, and again, here I forgot there is a square clearly, if alpha is a, a irrational number, which is, uh, um, not easily uh, uh, approximated by a rational one, then this M is gonna be smaller. So M is gonna be larger and depending on how badly approximated this alpha is from a rational number. And what I mean with badly or in a good or bad way depends on some concept and number theory that I will mention in a second. Okay, so a couple of remarks about the second theorem. Um, in the Coliander, Kiel, myself, um, Takaok and Tao work and the I team, we learned, as I, I mentioned before, that really the dynamics of the toy model, which is the growth, is um, sort of a subset of the dynamic of what I call NLS star before, which uh, contains all the quasi resonant um, interaction there. So, um, this theorem, sorry, theorem two that we have confirms that uh, really in the rational case, the growth is not gonna, it cannot be uh, coming from the, um, in this case, quasi resonant. Uh, because as I said, if you are, if you start with initial data, which are in a ball, after a certain, um, if you look in a larger ball, which only depends on the lambda and the time in, in the quasi resonant set, you see nothing outside that. Um, the second remark is that uh, 
the global whole poison is in L2 for the full periodic NLS, not just the resonant part, is a major open problem that uh, uh, people don't know how to resolve yet. This is because um, the way we know how to do the local world poisons depends on the street art estimates and the street art estimate, both rational and irrational, lose an epsilon derivative. Hence, the world poison is it's only known for the full NLS um, if you are in HS as strictly greater than zero. So um, proving that it is an L2, um, it's hard. And uh, the statement of my theorem here is that actually for the quasi-resonant, you can prove an L2. And I will try to point out why. Okay, um, ingredient again, um, uh, we use similar Verco normal form reduction, but obviously this, uh, um, it's, uh, um, it's uh, more complicated because um, I'm not gonna go into detail, but there is some loss of derivative here due to the fact that we're looking at the quasi-resonant set. Um, but um, we have um, a good, the change of variable that comes from this is uh, um, a good change of variable because also because we can offset the, uh, as I mentioned before, the large initial data by taking the lambda in the quasi-resonant set to be large enough as well. Now, the other main um, ingredient of the proof, it's Roth's theorem. And this is a theorem from uh, um, num a number theory, analytic number theory. And here is where the assumption that alpha, which indicates the rationality of the torus comes in, in terms of being algebraic is used. And uh, Roth's theorem tells us really that when we look at the quasi resonance set, all we have to worry about is really about the pure resonance frequency in the sense that if you consider how many of this frequency K1, K2, K3, K4, such that, okay, you have the, um, of course, the relationship due to the convolution, but now you are strictly greater than zero. So you are not resonant, but you are only quasi resonant. Well, this set is finite. Uh, the numbers of frequency like this is a finite number, which of course depends on uh, lambda that you pick, the alpha, the ras rational uh, number that you use, and tau. Okay. Um, now, um, the other ingredient that is really important here is the fact that uh, the um, resonance, um, resonance set per se, uh, like I said, we can ignore things that are quasi resonant but not resonant because there are finitely many of them and that number depends only on some fixed parameter. So when we do the analysis, really, even if we are looking at the quasi resonant set, we concentrate on the resonant. And the resonance set, as I say, is kind of decouples into two 1D resonant um, relationship, if you want. And uh, the fact that uh, in uh, 1D, the cubic NLS, it's uh, well posed in L2, that's, uh, that's a fact in that dimension, and also is integrable, in a sense plays um, an, uh, a role in, in our proof, not a direct proof. In fact, we don't use ever the, the what I just mentioned that the 1D cubic NLS is the well posed in L2 and that the, the 1D cubic NLS is integrable. But somehow, certain calculation that you do in the two dimension, but with the irrational torus and the fact that you have this decoupling in the um, resonance relationship, it, it, uh, um, it, it, it's, um, it played, it, um, it's similar to what you do in the 1D case in a sense. So the main proposition that I want to mention here, which is uh, um, a sort of a, a, a new conservation law in a sense, is the following. So if you take the Fourier coefficient of uh, um, your solution for your NLS star, remember that's the one which is quasi resonant, and you define um, this new norm in a sense, which is called NSMZ, which tells you to really look at, uh, this is nothing else than uh, the Sobolev, um, the way you will write the Sobolev norm using the Fourier coefficients. This is the weight that now I'm splitting in, into uh, just the first coordinate and the second coordinate with S. And then you first 
take the sum when m is greater than uh, the, free, the first frequency is the first component is less than m and then the second component less than m and you sum this so it happens that uh, uh, this quantity it's constant and this is for any s this is not just the l2 or a part of the hamiltonian but this is for any s and this is zero and uh, um, the remarkable fact is that you use exactly what I said before, the decoupling of the uh, resonance set into one dimension. Um, just briefly, I want to present some numerical results here. Um, I'm not the one doing the numerics, so um, you have to take this, uh, with, you know, um, just um, don't ask me how this is done because I will not be able to answer, but these are the pictures that uh, my collaborators uh, did. So in the first uh, picture, I just wanted to um, discuss a little bit to the quasi resonance set and the difference between, this is in the irrational case, in, in fact, the alpha is square root of two, and this is the rational case. So if you like the square torus. And uh, this is just what happens if you, um, if you look at uh, um, um, the dots that you see here, I know this is small, but just look at the profile. So you start with uh, just frequency in the box, minus two, two, and minus two, two. And then you uh, see, you uh, start uh, coloring or drawing the frequencies that are in quasi resonance with them. And you can see that in the rational case, there are quite a lot more. So there is much more frequency that get excited by the quasi resonancy, while in the irrational case, much fewer. Um, this is a picture about the barriers and again, the difference between the rational and irrational. This pic first picture here is the common initial data. We only excited a very small frequency. And then after a certain time, this is uh, just a time um, that is computed um, in a certain way. But anyway, after this uh, time, unit times, the picture that you see in the left is the one for the rational torus again with square root of two. And the picture you see on the right is the one for the just square torus. And you see that it's much larger uh, after the same time. And then even more telling is the growth of the Sobolin norm. So um, I know this is a different notation I have been using you while here it's a uh, fee, but uh, uh, never mind that. So this is just the um, HS norm, if you like. Um, and this is uh, down below is uh, the time, how is this counted? And the profile that you see in the continuous line is the one where we use the um, irrational square root of two. And the one with the, the dotted line is where uh, in terms of the torus, the rational torus for the same data. And uh, finally, this is a picture on the rational torus, sorry, irrational torus right here, but for different um, um, sizes of the initial data. So, um, and of course, this is uh, um, well, just a, a snapshot of that, but this is the uh, smaller r, 1.8 something. This is the second 2.8, and this is the last one, 3.3 and so on. And you see how it grows in time, the HS norm. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Are there any questions for Giliola? Um, I have a question it's for Giliola. Giliola? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, you can hear me. So, so the, 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 the question I have is like, I was wondering, this is a really great talk. But I wanted to ask you, like, in the when you look at the quasi resonant uh, problem, you know, so so Burgen has for the L4 has an explicit counterexample that tells you that the L4 grows logarithmic. And I was wondering in the 2D cubic, I was wondering if when you take this quasi resonant uh, nonlinearity, you can check that the counterexample doesn't survive. Oh, I don't. Um... I mean, it should be the case, right? Because you're proving something positive. Yeah, uh, I didn't check that, so I should, I should, uh, I should check that thing. Yeah. So maybe I should talk to you about what uh, we can talk about that and see what it is. I didn't check that. Yes, that's what I can say. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you.
May I ask also a question, actually? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I didn't get, so how do you, I mean, the, for the definition of the quasi-resonant set, so you impose some non-resonance conditions by moving the lattice, or uh, you just say for any lattice? No, so um, the quasi-resonant, uh, I can go back to that, but the, um, the lattice, the, the K, K1, the frequency are always in Z2. That's the, so what is gonna, what really that tells you is uh, um, when you look at the denominator of the eigenvalue, so the, the connection, so how um, non-zero that could be. So you have, when it's zero, okay, you have all your resonance set, but when it is non-zero, but in terms of this uh, condition that comes from the Rolls theorem, then there are finitely many points that finitely many frequency that uh, satisfy that um, quasi resonant conditions. Oh, and outside that, you don't have anything anymore. The reason, so it is a reason why this is better than just taking the resonance set, because that, uh, when you have the denominator, your lambda comes down, and the, but you pay with some derivatives, mm -hmm. but you can make the lambda bigger and make some kind of stability result work in that sense. That's how it is uh, played. You lose derivatives for sure, but you can use the lambda to offset the size of the initial data. Because usually, I mean, when we when we lose derivatives, we do like uh, a parallel normal form. Yes. And then you. Yes. Actually, exactly. I mean, actually, we are working on long time existence on these, and we actually improved up to order epsilon to the minus four. Uh -huh. Time of existence in 2D. Okay. Okay. But we have to move the angles. Otherwise, no, we, we didn't do that. So maybe we should we should talk about that. Oh, yeah. No, we didn't do that. We'll will it's simple. That, now I understand why you asked the question. Uh, I had, uh, no, no, I need yeah. because uh, I would be glad okay. to discuss because uh, indeed I read your paper with the Bobby and uh, yeah. Um, but this is the number theory lemma and it also essentially on the lattice Z2. Exactly. And, uh, and in a way this measures, so the lambda and so on, that, that also measures how this result is really for irrational point that are not easily approximated by rational. And that's why also in the numerics, we use square root of two because that's a number that is not easily approximated by, a, by, and hence it allows you to absorb a lot of errors that you make in the, in the approximations. If you take some other irrational number, you will not see those pictures. Yeah, yeah, indeed. indeed it's also, yeah. I think also the first results on periodic solutions for PDEs were with the badly rational. Yeah. We have some gain, yeah. essentially, so. Yeah. So I feel like there should be a continuous, no continuous, but uh, I mean, this is kind of like a, an ext maybe the best the one, not best, but uh, this kind of results is because the irrational point is really irrational. And uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you really get closer to the square torus. And, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, it was a wonderful talk. And, uh, Any further questions from the audience? Maybe uh, can I ask one further question? Yes. Uh, so is there any implication of the barrier theorem on the growth of Sobolev norms? <laughs> <laughs> Good, okay, you know what to ask. Um, no, in the sense that you can say, okay, so if you can get a good handle on what M is, mm. yes. So for example, if you can say that M is uh, T to the, whatever, epsilon something, then that's the inverse and so would be, t to the epsilon would be the power. But right. it's pretty large because the, at the moment, it's not better than what Bourguin does in saying this. So this more than, uh, this theorem should be seen more than uh, the growth of Sobolev. It's just like what's outside a certain barrier. So it's not a character characterization how that grows, but it's like uh, there is really no much outside a certain, barrier that we have. But if you could improve the barrier, 
then yes, that will give automatically um, a better uh, polynomial growth. Thanks. So then may maybe one final question. Do you expect something similar to also hold in for energy critical problems? Because you were saying ah. Thing was moody. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I have, I, I at least have to say that I didn't think about it, and uh, um, but will be um, certainly worth looking at it. I mean, one of the surprising thing in this uh, work that we did was uh, I, we were not expecting to be able to do the L2 well poisons, for example, for that piece. So this irrationality definitely removed uh, some, I wouldn't, yeah, some criticality to the problem, right? Because the, this, the whole problem, um, just the NLS, um, NL2, it's critical. Um, but this particular piece of the, um, of the NLS, uh, it sort of doesn't behave that way for this, uh, for the word postness at that point. Okay, thanks very much. So then let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you.